Good evening and welcome to Give Me the Bible. This is a series that is being produced by Kenneth Cox Ministries and our speaker tonight will be Evangelist Kenneth Cox. And we want to welcome you no matter where you're tuning in from around the world. And we want to welcome our live audience as well. It is so good to be able to sit at the feet of someone who has really studied in depth. And that's what Kenneth Cox has done. And he has traveled during his public ministry. He has covered the world. And we're very fortunate to have him here at 3ABN. And he is going to be continuing his second part of a five-part series. The series title title is the Elijah message. Last night we heard about the coming of Elijah. And do you remember what he said? The Lord said at the close of the Old Testament that before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, he was going to send the prophet Elijah. And Jesus, when he was talking about John the Baptist, said that if you had ears to hear and you could understand that John the Baptist was the Elijah that was to come. But when we think about the Elijah message, we learned last night that this is all about what? Turning the hearts of the fathers to whom? to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. This is such a timely message. We need to hear this because families are crumbling. And why are they? Because the devil knows that the family is the smallest unit of the church. And if he can break up the families, he can break up the church. But we're going to go on tonight. We're going to hear about Abraham's altar. This, there was a practice that Abraham had held for all of his life, and it really did contribute to the salvation of his family. So we're very pleased. Before Kenneth, Pastor Kenneth Cox comes out, we're going to have, you know, we're thinking about family harmony right now. Well, we've got a precious family here tonight, and they do have sister harmony. We're going to introduce to you the Mitchell sisters. There's Brenda, Cinda, and Linda, and they're going to be singing Redeemed.
Redeemed, what wonderful news to know that we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you to the Mitchiff sisters. We appreciate them being here tonight. How are you this evening? Amen. Had a good day? Yes. Great. All of those of you who are watching by television or listening over the radio, we're glad to welcome you tonight. Hope that this subject will be a special blessing to your family in a definite way. As you know, we're talking about the Elijah message. And we found out last night that the Elijah message deals with the home, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers. And that's what the Elijah message is about. And that's what we're talking about during this series. Our, pre our next presentation is entitled, Bless This House. Bless This House. There are certain things that the Scripture gives us, lays it down very clear that if you and I will follow those, that God will bless our home. Promises that, absolutely, that if we'll do it. And we'll find tonight, or tomorrow, excuse me, on our next presentation, that the promises of God are conditional. They're conditional. And He lays down conditions that if you and I fulfill those conditions, then the blessing is sure. So we hope that this subject on bless this house will be of help to you in a special way. And then tonight our subject is Abraham's altar. Abraham's altar. Uh, there are certain things that you need to look for in tonight's presentation that Abraham did that affected his family, and his descendants for generations made a great, great difference. And it had to do with the family. And so watch for that as we talk about Abraham's altar. And it gives us some insights into what you and I need to be doing and what God expects of us. And so we hope that tonight's presentation will be a blessing to you in a special way. We're glad that you're here glad that you're watching. We hope that uh, as you continue to study God's Word, it will continue to lead and guide you as you go through the Scripture day by day. We're very happy to have the Mitchiff sisters with us, and they're singing a song tonight entitled, Whatever It Takes. Thank you. 
Gracious Lord, we come to you this evening asking that you'll be present, that you'll send your Holy Spirit, that it may quicken our minds, give us receptive hearts, pray that we each may understand our responsibilities and that we might be willing to follow you in all that we do. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I don't know of anything in the Christian life that the devil fights more than what we're going to talk about tonight. In fact, he will do everything that he can think of to keep you from doing it. He will give you every excuse in the world not to do it. He'll convince you that you're too busy that you don't have enough time, he'll do everything he can to keep you from doing what we're talking about tonight. So I hope that you will see and understand and purpose in your heart that you are going to do what God wants you to do. Abraham of old, Abraham left Ur the Chaldees, he and his father, his brother, quite a few others, and they made their way up to a place called Haran. Haran was right there by the river, very beautiful country, lots of grass and everything, and they settled there, and that's where they stayed for a number of years. But God had called Abraham to leave there and to go to the land of Canaan. When God asked Abraham to go to the land of Canaan, folks, he was asking Abraham to go into a very, very hostile environment because the people that lived in Canaan were pagans. They were pagans. They practiced all kinds of immorality. They sacrificed animals to pagan gods. They even sacrificed their children. They were terrible. So why would God take Abraham and put him into such a hostile environment? Why would he do that? Because God made this statement. For I have known him. God said when it comes to Abraham, I've known him in order that he may command his, what? Command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So God said, I trust Abraham. He's my friend. He will do what I ask him to do. And he will raise his children as I have instructed him to raise them. Now, when it talks about Abraham's household, what kind of a household did he have? Well, Abraham's household numbered a lot. Abraham left Haran, came down, and came into the land of Canaan. And when he came into the land of Canaan, Canaan, the very first place he came to was Shechem. Can you remember that? Shechem. And in Shechem, he built an altar there. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, 
to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. Now, it says he met him there, and he built an altar. And it says, I know, Abraham, that he will direct his household after me. Well, Abraham's household numbered over a thousand. Did you realize that? His household numbered over a thousand people. And when they built an altar, they didn't build an altar just to offer sacrifice on. That wasn't the total purpose of the altar. True, they brought an animal and offered it there, but the altar was where they came and worshipped. They came to there every morning and every evening and worshipped God at this altar. The altar was the center of their activity. Uh, everything went on around it, and so when they came to a place where they stayed, they built an altar, and that's where they worshipped. But Abraham, as it said here, had a lot of people in his household. Do you remember the time when these kings came down and they raided uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and they took uh, Abraham's nephew captive? Remember that? Listen to this. Now, when Abram heard that his brother, and by that way, that's talking about Lot, his brother was taken captive, he armored, he armed his, how many? 318 trained servants, listen, who were born in his house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. So he had 318 men there, servants, that were born in his household. So his household was not just a few, and when he took them, he trained them and taught them about the Lord, and they followed the Lord. So everywhere that Abraham went, all across the land of Canaan, you could follow his travels because there would be an altar there. They built an altar, and you could see exactly where Abraham went. And when these pagan people came along, they could see the altar, and they knew that's where Abraham had been. And not only did Abraham do that, but he taught his sons to worship God, to bring their families before the Lord. And so we read here, so he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. So we find that Isaac, following the same custom of Abraham, wherever they stopped and spent time, they built an altar there. But Isaac took it a step farther. He had his servants dig a well. And so there at the altar where they worshiped, there was also a well that provided water and life. It was there, and, you know, you could follow wherever place that Isaac went because one thing, there was a well there. It was green around it. And so they could see exactly where Isaac had been, and he worshiped and followed the Lord, and it continues to say about him. It says, then he erected an altar there, called it El Elohi Israel. These were places where they built altars to the Lord. Well, do you remember uh, his son, Jacob? Well, you remember Jacob went down to uh, his uncle Laban's house. Spent, where was Uncle Laban? See how your Bible is. Well, he was over in Haran, I told you about, okay? So he goes over, spends some time with his uncle Laban and married Laban's two daughters. You remember that? And then the Lord said to him, said, Jacob, it's time for you to come back. And Jacob is coming back, and the very first place he comes into the land of Canaan was at Shechem, very same place that Abraham had come in. He came there to Shechem, and that, what did he do there? He built and rebuilt the altar, and he dug a well. And 1,700 years later, the son of Jacob was there drinking the water from the well that Jacob dug. But that well was where the altar was, and this is where they came and they worshipped God. It's what took place there. 
Now, watch. Watch the circumstances or the consequences of having and not having morning and evening worship. Because Abraham, they were there at the altar every morning, every evening. That's where his household met, and they worshiped. Same thing with Isaac, same thing with Jacob, right on down. But there was an individual in Abraham's household that did not follow the custom. And then Lot chose for himself all the plains of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. There, God had blessed Abraham. He had blessed Lot until they had more cattle than they could be together with because there wasn't enough pasture to take care of both of them. So they had to separate, and Lot went down into the plains of Jordan and down by Sodom and Gomorrah because they were well uh, watered, they were beautiful, and so he took his family, and they moved to Sodom and Gomorrah. There is no record here, friend, no record here at all of Lot, who the Bible says was a righteous man. Don't misunderstand me. But there's no record of him having morning and evening worship. There's no record of Lot building an altar. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan. Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. All right. Years pass. And the Lord said, and the Lord's talking to Abraham here. That's what he's doing. It says, and the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether, the, whether they have done according, altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. He said, I'm going to go down, find out. Okay? Now, if you read the story, here is Christ and two angels, and they've been there, and they've been visiting with Abraham, and he's telling Abraham, what he's going to do. He said, I'm going to go down and take a look at Sodom and Gomorrah and see if it's as bad as they say it is. Then the men, the two angels, turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Interesting. Two angels go on toward Sodom. Abraham stands before the Lord, and he says to him, and Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? I asked him, said, Are, you're, you're going down there, and this city's wicked, but would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? What if there's 50 righteous people there? Would you destroy it? And the Lord said, No. And Abraham said, Well, what if there's 40? Would you destroy it? The Lord said, no. Keeps reducing. He said, what if there's 20? He said, no, wouldn't destroy it. Well, well, what if there's 10? He said, no, wouldn't destroy it. He said, what, what if there's just five? He said, no, won't destroy it. Those angels... They're down in Sodom and Gomorrah now, and they have found Lot. Now, folks, Lot is a good man. You must understand that. But he hasn't done what he should have done for his household, for his children. And those angels have told him, God's going to destroy the city. Get out. Get out now. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-laws, who had married his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his son-in-laws, he seemed to be joking. You see, they didn't understand anything about this. There was no altar. There was nothing there that taught them day by day. And when he told them he's going to burn this place up, to them, he was joking. Then Lot went up 
out of Zor and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters with him, were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zor, and he and his two daughters dwelled in a cave. They fled. Only Lot and his two daughters made it. Even Lot's wife didn't make it. Her heart was still right back there in that city. These daughters that Lot has, they're not followers of God. They, they don't understand because Lot has not taken the time to have morning and evening worship with them and to teach them. And so they don't understand. And so they get there in the cave and they say, what's going to happen to us? Here we are in this cave and we don't have any descendants. What's going to happen to us? And so they decided among themselves that they would get their father drunk. And they would go in and sleep with him. And become pregnant that they might have a descendant. And so each one of those daughters got pregnant by their father. And they had two sons. One's name was Moab. And the other's name was ben Ami. Those two sons became the fathers of two nations, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And those two fought against Israel for years. And dear friends, all I'm trying to show you tonight is the results when we don't follow what God says and we don't have enough time and we don't think it's important enough to spend time taking our children before the Lord morning and evening that they might know the Lord. Nothing, nothing is as important as doing this. All your children shall be taught by the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. This is what God wants us to do. All your children shall be taught of the Lord. And if we will take the time to teach them the Lord, it says great will be the peace of your children. Because they've got something to build on. They've got a foundation. They've got something to place their belief in and their, where they stand. It's given them the kind of foundation that they need. I'm going to share with you tonight three statements out of books. These are statements that to me have great, great meaning on this subject. It says, by sincere, earnest prayer, parents should make a hedge about their children. Do you ever think about that? That when you're praying, you're building a hedge around your children? You don't want the devil to get in there. Build a hedge around them, okay, about their children. They should pray with full faith that God will abide with them and that holy angels will guard them and their children from Satan's cruel power. This is important. In every family, there should be a fixed time for morning and evening worship. In every family, there should be a fixed time for morning and evening worship. If you don't do that, you won't get it done. Sorry. If you don't do that, you will not get it done. You need to have a fixed time for morning and evening worship. And even then, I'll guarantee you, the devil will do everything he can to keep you from doing it. Because there's too much here at stake. And therefore he fights it for all he can to make sure that that doesn't happen. But in every home, there should be morning and evening worship. Now when they came to the altar, many times when they came, they brought a sacrifice. There could be a sacrifice brought for sins, or there could be a sacrifice brought as a thank offering, 
or there could be just a sacrifice as a free will offering. But they, they brought a sacrifice and offered it there on the altar. But it wasn't the only time. They came every morning and every evening and worshiped together. But today, what sacrifice do we bring? We don't bring a lamb anymore because Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God. So we don't need to bring a lamb. So it says they brought a sacrifice. Are we to bring a sacrifice? Well, I want you to listen because these are the sacrifices that you and I are supposed to bring every morning and every evening. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, you and I are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. What does that mean? That means each morning when I get up, I need to dedicate my life to the Lord and give my life anew to Him every day. Let me tell you something. There is no such thing as a person getting up every day and giving his life to the Lord and doing that every day and that person missing heaven. Impossible. That person who gets up and will give his life to the Lord every day that is what gets us ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Let me explain what it means by offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. Nebuchadnezzar had built this huge image out on the plains of Dur, and he told them that they were to worship it. And you remember he set up uh, a band and everything and told them when the music was to play they were to bow down and worship the image well they all bowed down except Shadrach Meshach and Abednego they didn't and Nebuchadnezzar called them in Shadrach Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king O king we have no need to answer you in this matter Nebuchadnezzar called them in and said what's this I hear have you ever thought about this? Huh? You go back and you read Daniel, and I mean, these men had been promoted. They had been promoted by Nebuchadnezzar until they were at the very top of the echelon. I mean, they were, uh, they were the leaders of the country. And he had treated them wonderful, and here they're refusing to bow down to his God. And he had told them, you bow down to my God, or I'm going to throw you in the furnace. And they said, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, if you're going to throw us in the fire furnace, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Boy, that was not something you said to Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, that just isn't what you said to him. But they said, you know, we're, God's perfectly capable. But if not, let, offer your body a living sacrifice. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. They said, even if he doesn't deliver us, we're not going to worship your God. And I mean, he said, fired up, seven times hotter. It was so hot that it killed the guards that threw them in. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked in there, he said, didn't we throw three? Didn't we throw three men in there? I see four. I see one like the Son of God. You see, you and I are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Psalms 4, verse 4. A great, great text, folks. 
Meditate within your heart on your bed. You know what that's saying? Before you get up in the morning, while you're still in bed, take a little time and talk to the Lord. Meditate to the Lord. And then it says, and be still. Most of us don't listen to that. You know, we may meditate a little bit, but then we jump up. Quit it. Lay there a little bit. You might hear the Lord speak to you. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness. What sacrifice? Righteousness. That means living a daily, living a righteous life day by day. And put your trust in the Lord. So you and I should live for the Lord every day. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We are to offer a sacrifice of praise. When did you stop the last time and just praise the Lord? When did you do that the last time? Now, I'm not talking about thanking him. I'm talking about praising him. That is a sacrifice that you and I are to bring to him, a sacrifice of praise. That's something he tells us to do. But do not forget to do what? Good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So it tells us that we're to live we're to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. We're to offer the sacrifice of righteousness. That we're to offer the sacrifice of praise. That we're to offer the sacrifice of doing good and of sharing. These are all sacrifices that you and I are to bring to God day by day. It's what we're to do in our worship of the Lord. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us what? Shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. When's the last time you shouted? You know, I really worry about this. Because I read, when I pick up my Bible, I read that there's going to be people standing on the sea of glass, and they're going to say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and, and this type of thing. And most of you folks don't even know those words. <laughs> that we need to learn to shout. The praises of God, that's part of our, what we're to do. This is part of praising God together. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. God wants us to offer to him the sacrifice of praise. Well, let's talk a little bit about family worship. Because I'm sorry. There are parents that have family worship that the kids can't hardly wait to get out of there. And I want to talk about what it's to be. You know, what, what we're supposed to do as far as family worship is concerned, how God wants us to conduct it. So to begin with, family worship should be happy. Put it down, it should be happy. If you got up on the wrong side of the bed, get back in bed and get out on the other side. You know, that you should not come down to family worship in a sour mood. You and I need to be happy. The children have, they should find us happy in our relationship to God. And so make sure that family worship is a joyful place. It's happy. Secondly, it should be interesting. And that means you need to take just a little bit of time to make it interesting. It, don't let it be an afterthought. Take some time to think about it and make it interesting for the children. Need to do that. Thirdly, it needs to be sacred. And I have to be very careful here because this is kind of a hobby horse with me. It's to be sacred. Don't make it common. I'm sorry, but we live in an age today that they don't understand the difference between common and sacred. That worship needs to be a sacred time, and they should understand that, and it should have that presence to it and not just make it 
common. That's not what it's to be. Four, it's to be short. It's not the time where you're going to, you know, give an exegesis on something. It's to be short, not long. But it should have all those elements in it. It should be happy. It should be interesting. It should be sacred. But it should be short. And finally, it should be spirited. It should move. Don't drag it along, you know. These are things that family worship is to be, folks. And you and I need to just take the time to make sure that our family worship is that. I'll guarantee you that if your family worship has those elements in it, every morning and every evening, the children will gladly come to it. Gladly come to it. Okay? All right, that's family worship. Let's look at one other aspect. The use of incense in the Old Testament. You know, they used incense. They had censers and they waved censers and the smoke went up out of the censer and all. Uh, what does that have to do with us today? See? What, what is the incense that they used back then? What, how is it represented today? Well, this is what it tells us. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was for the Lord. That incense today is your prayers. And that when you and I pray, that is mixed with incense and it comes up before the Lord. It even says this, folks. And the smoke of the incense with the prayer of the saints ascended before God from the angels' hands. So it says that the angels take your prayers in their hands and present them before God as incense. Never, never, never does your prayers uh, not come up before God. People say, well, my prayers don't get to the ceiling. No, they don't. They go clear to heaven. They're taken there in the hands of the angel. He presents it before God. That's what the incense represents in his to be. Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the door of the Church of Wittenberg. But Martin Luther said this, I'm so busy today, I must pray more. And dear friend, when you're so busy and you feel like you just don't have time, pray a little more. You'll find that you'll get a whole lot more done, a whole lot more accomplished if you just pray more. Very important. From these homes... This is another statement. I told you I was going to give you three. From these homes, morning and evening prayer ascends to God. As sweet incense and his mercies and blessings descend upon the supplement like the morning dew. It says that your prayers come up before God like sweet incense and God pours out his blessings upon you as morning dew. That's what he does. For each one of us blesses in a very special way. Jim and Pam Rhodes that help us and sing many times in our meetings. Uh, Jim and Pam both were teachers and taught for a number of years. Pam tells a story of a little boy by the name of Bobby that came on the first day of school and walked into the room and he was every teacher's nightmare. Uh, Bobby could not sit down. He could not shut up. He was just uncontrollable, getting into trouble with the kids all the time. And, and Pam is very much in her classroom a disciplinarian. And so she said to herself, uh, just give us a few days and we'll get Bobby in, in shape. Well, the days went along and... Uh, it didn't get Bobby in shape. It got Pam out of shape. Uh, you know, she, she didn't know what to do with the boy. And so she went and got her 
child psychology books and all the things that she had had in school and went back and started reading them and seeing if she could figure out what in the world she could do to help this boy. But nothing, I mean nothing she did, would help him. She went to the other teachers in the school and talked to them and asked them for advice. Nobody could seem to find any kind of an answer to help him. And finally, distraught at home, she was praying, and she was praying to the Lord about Bobby. And the Lord said to her, Pam, you haven't tried me. And she said, forgive me, Lord. And the next morning, when she was there, and Bobby came every morning early to school, and she was sitting at her desk, and Bobby came in and walked up to her desk, and she said to him, she said, Bobby, would you like to pray with me? And he said, yes, teacher, I'd like to pray with you. And they went over to a, just a place that was quiet, and they knelt there and prayed. And she said, Bobby, if you'll come every morning, uh, we'll pray together. And he said, okay, teacher. And every morning when he came, he would come and they would pray together. And mornings when she was busy, he'd pull on her skirt and say, teacher, we need to pray. And they'd go over and pray. And she said it wasn't, it wasn't a month or two. It was just a matter of days. And all of a sudden, Bobby sat in his seat longer. And uh, he didn't talk out loud like he used to. And he didn't have trouble with the students like he had before. Begin to change. And she said one day, his mother came to the school. His mother came in a room and said, Are you praying with my boy? And Pam said, Yes, I am. And she said, He came home the other day and said to me, Mother, will you pray with me like Mrs. Rhodes does? Jesus is my best friend. And she said, so we started praying. We prayed together. And he said to us, said, could we go to church? And she said, now our whole family goes to church. Says, it's changed our whole lives. Oh, dear friend, if we'd just take our children and take them to the Lord. It would change our lives and make us totally different. We just need to spend time with them. Great, great statement. I want you to listen to it. Morning and evening. Listen to this. Morning and evening, the heavenly universe takes notice of every praying household. Morning and evening, the heavenly universe takes notice of every praying household. How important that is. And so I would say to you, mothers, fathers, gather your family around you. Ask God to bless each one. Plead for the sweet Holy Spirit to guide you till day's work is done. And then when the long day is ended, gather around once more to thank God for keeping his promise and praise him for he is the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we have looked what the scripture shows us of the importance of spending time with our families in worship. And, oh, Lord, we realize and we know how the devil fights this and how he does everything to keep us from having it. We ask, Lord, that we may learn to commit our lives to you, that you can handle the circumstances that you can bring good out of any situation and we pray that we might turn it over to you Lord that you might have your way in our lives forgive us forgive us where we have failed where we've not done what we should have and help us to depend upon you 
to realize that you're able to guide and direct and may we have the privilege not because we're worthy but may we have the privilege of having our families with us in your kingdom because of what Jesus Christ has done for each one of us for this we ask in his name amen our next presentation is entitled bless this house and the Lord just simply says that there are certain things that if you and I will do them that he will bless our home and, and folks as you read through the book he promised it over and over and over to the children of Israel and when they did it he blessed them wonderfully and he'll do the same for you and for me if we will just fulfill what God asks us to do. So come for our next presentation, those of you who join us by television, as we take a look at Bless This House. Good night. God bless you. Although they're small and seemingly insignificant, soybean pods fill the farm fields of the United States. What a treasure they are for the farmer at harvest time. Nearly all soybeans in this country are processed for their oil, which is then refined for cooking or sold for biodiesel production, as well as for many other industrial uses. Because of the high demand for soybeans, a farmer must be able to harvest large quantities in the most efficient and cost-effective manner. One of the best ways to do this is to use a combined harvester. These massive machines give the farmer the ability to quickly harvest and hull the beans at an incredible rate. Have you ever considered what one farmer can do today with the help of modern tools? The farmer of the past could hardly imagine it. Within hours, one man and a machine can harvest and deliver untold bushels of soybeans to the market. His goal is to obtain the largest yield possible at harvest time. Like the farmer today, we must do the same. In Luke 10 and verse 2, Jesus said the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. And in John 4:35, he looked over the wheat fields and said to his disciples, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. In both passages, Jesus referred to men and women of this world as he proclaimed that the harvest is here and the work must be done. When I was a boy, the corn harvest was all done by hand. We literally had a horse-drawn wagon, and we would walk along beside it and pull the corn off the stalk and throw it onto the wagon. But folks, the time is short, so the Lord has provided the most marvelous technology to enable us to harvest more souls through television, radio, and other media. Today, we can take the message to the multitudes around the world at the speed of light. Such ability was far beyond the imagination of the evangelist of the past. The harvest is here, but we can't do it without you. Won't you help us? Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries. P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television and radio. Your gifts help bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. Give Me the Bible broadcasts are available on DVD. Each individual program of the Elijah Message series may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire five-part series, including The Coming of Elijah, Abraham's Altar, Bless This House, Heaven is My Home, 
and Great and Dreadful Day of the Lord may be ordered as a set for a total of $49.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. You may also order online at kennethcoxministries.org. Give me the Bible on DVD. Each message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors. Give Me the Bible broadcasts are available on DVD. Each individual program of the Elijah Message series may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire five-part series, including The Coming of Elijah, Abraham's Altar, Bless This House, Heaven is My Home, and Great and Dreadful Day of the Lord may be ordered as a set for a total of $49.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. You may also order online at kennethcoxministries.org. Give me the Bible on DVD. Each message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors. Although they're small and seemingly insignificant, soybean pods fill the farm fields of the United States. What a treasure they are for the farmer at harvest time. Nearly all soybeans in this country are processed for their oil, which is then refined for cooking or sold for biodiesel production, as well as for many other industrial uses. Because of the high demand for soybeans, a farmer must be able to harvest large quantities in the most efficient and cost-effective manner. One of the best ways to do this is to use a combined harvester. These massive machines give the farmer the ability to quickly harvest and hull the beans at an incredible rate. Have you ever considered what one farmer can do today with the help of modern tools? The farmer of the past could hardly imagine it. Within hours, one man and a machine can harvest and deliver untold bushels of soybeans to the market. His goal is to obtain the largest yield possible at harvest time. Like the farmer today, we must do the same. In Luke 10 and verse 2, Jesus said the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. And in John 4:35, he looked over the wheat fields and said to his disciples, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. In both passages, Jesus referred to men and women of this world as he proclaimed that the harvest is here and the work must be done. When I was a boy, the corn harvest was all done by hand. We literally had a horse-drawn wagon, and we would walk along beside it and pull the corn off the stalk and throw it onto the wagon. But folks, the time is short, so the Lord has provided the most marvelous technology to enable us to harvest more souls through television, radio, and other media. Today, we can take the message to the multitudes around the world at the speed of light. Such ability was far beyond the imagination of the evangelist of the past. The harvest is here, but we can't do it without you. Won't you help us? Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television and radio. Your gifts help bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world.